What up, gang? This Ken Zark, Ken Zilligan, Zika Milligan, the villain for the trilogy, and we are back on Umi Neko, no Naku Koro Ni, Rondo of the Witch, and Riza Ne. Last episode. What the? What happened last episode? I, I did this like late last night. Fuck! I think Bro proposed to Sean on or some shit, right? And now he's waiting for her response, and something like. Okay, the gold bars are real. Kraus showed Natsu he wanted the gold bars. It confirmed that, yes, the gold is indeed real. And it can be found. But that's about all I know. <laughs> that's all about all I remember. Shannon entered the entrance hall to the mansion with a tottering gait. A mixture of ex ex exaltation and uncertainty gave her a feeling that she couldn't easily describe. It welled up in her chest until it felt like it was a pill about to burst. After stopping for a second in front of the servant room, take a deep breath and calm her heart, she opened the door. Inside, Goda, who had been ordered to take the midnight shift at the mansion tonight, was absorbed in a worn-out crossword puzzle magazine. He looked up for an instant to see if one of the family had come, but when he realized it was a fellow servant, he returned to his puzzle as if nothing happened. That's so real. That's so real. Um, Genji told me to come and help you. Don't fucking lie. Ah, uh, is that so? That's a relief. I was just about to go check the mansion was fully locked up. But I felt uneasy about leaving this room on man. After all, Carlos and the others meeting. Carlos and the others meeting looks as though it will continue for quite some time. They might request some tea at any moment. That's true. Then what shall we do? Should we watch over? In that case, forgive me, Shannon. But I'll ask that you patrol the mansion. I will stay here awaiting the family's orders. This nigga wants to slack off. Do your job, nigga. Yes. Shannon was slightly disgusted. Even though she'd come here to help out as a favor, she was casually forced to do the job of the person actually on duty. Furthermore, after one-sidedly forcing that task on her, Gota returned to his magazine once again and became immersed in his crossword puzzle. I don't- I do not like this nigga, bro. My two least favorite characters in this bitch is Gota and Kraus. I still fuck with Ava, but you not- she not as high as she used to be, bro. After what she, after what- that, after finding out that shit she pulled on Natsuhi, she's not as high up as she used to be. Shannon bowed her head as a token sign of respect for her elder, then he then left the room to patrol the mansion. Thanks to her being a bit ticked off, she managed to suppress the floating feeling she'd been having until just now. Anyway, she couldn't let Genji or Kano see her looking like this. She wanted a little time to herself until her heart calmed down, so maybe going on patrol wouldn't be so bad. She began to hear the tumultuous voices of the family discussion coming from the dining hall. Someone was speaking at great length, only to be interrupted by someone else. The second person also began to speak in a very long, drawn-out fashion, until yet another person interrupted. That kept on repeating. It was as though their displeasure was seeping out through their voices. She had been told to go to the guest house, so it would be bad if Kraus discovered her. Thinking this, Shannon dashed past the dining hall. Then she went along a prearranged route through the dark mansion, checking that all the locks were secure. She walked down the hall, checking each window. There were no humans on Rock and Jima other than those connected to the family. The lock and gun didn't really serve much of a purpose. No one had been in the habit of locking up with the Ushua Mia head family. At least not until Natsui had scolded them for being careless. The metal fixtures on the windows were ice cold, and as she checked them one by one, the glow in her heart seemed to calm down. Oh. The fuck? Butterflies. At that time, she thought she saw something twinkling across the hall. Twinkling? How could anything be twinkling through the darkness of the hall? She figured she must have been imagining it, but she still held her breath. Grasping a curtain, she fearfully gazed down the hall. However, other than the occasional creak of thunder brightening the hallway, 
she was unable to glimpse any flicker again. Must have been her imagination after all. No. Maybe her heart was so agitated that she'd seen something that didn't even exist. Shauna went back to checking the windows. However, a certain unnerving memory was resurrected in the back of her mind. It was that ghost story which had been passed down amongst the servants who served the Yeshua Mia family. The mansion had two different masters, one of the day and one of the night. Beatrice, the master of the night, would sometimes fly around the mansion in the form of sparkling butterflies. That was the story. Come to think of it, didn't Kanon once say he'd seen it with his own eyes? Though he got sulky when I said he must have imagined it and refused to believe him. Could it possibly be true? The roar of the thunder gave no answer. Wow. Is Beatrice real, guys? Is Beatrice real? Should have grabbed something to drink. She bad as fuck. All right, are we? Are we just gonna keep looking at the portrait? Is there? There we go. Okay. <laughs> we're just gonna. We're just looking at the portrait. Thank you. All right, now 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 I'm just looking at him. Okay. Oh, we're looking at Oh, we're seeing where everybody is. Hey Kumasawa. This music is beautiful. All the pieces are in place. What will you see on the game board? The fuck does that mean? Was that the end? Just like that? Oh shit. Oh shit. The second day, October 5th, 1986. Genji tightened his bow tie and looked outside through a crack in the curtains. Maybe the rain had died down a tiny bit since the previous night, but the thick rain clouds didn't seem like they'd be letting any trace of the morning sun get by. The morning was dim and far from refreshing. It seems it will last all day after all. Sorry for keeping you waiting, Genji. Kanon finished checking his appearance and exited the washroom. On their normal schedule, it was rare for anyone after supper going straight from a midnight shift to an early morning shift. They were on a special schedule for the two days of the family conference. However, unless the typhoon passed today, the relative stay on this island would last until tomorrow. Kana thought it best be prepared for the special schedule to last an extra day. 
The two of them left the guest house, opening their umbrellas. The Rose Garden had been devastated by the wind and rain on the previous night. Even though they'd spent several days making it beautiful to welcome the guests, one stormy night was enough to ruin it. Kind on side. The two headed for the mansion. They were supposed to meet up with Goda and prepare breakfast. Goda was such a perfectionist that he probably already woken up and was probably already preparing a breakfast as exquisite and elegant as glasswork. They reached the overhang by the entrance of the mansion and folded up their umbrellas. That's where they found Goda, fucking dead. I wish. Genji took a bundle of several keys from his pocket and unlocked the front door. The Oshiramiya family mansion was the only thing on Rock and Jima, so in the past they hadn't been in the habit of locking up. However, Natsui had ordered that the mansion be locked up from midnight to early morning. Better safe than sorry, you know. You never know when fucking Goku wants to pull up to the wants to fly to the island and just steal all your TVs and shit. Ever since then, unlocking the door in the early morning had become in part part of the servant's morning shift. The task had been given to Genji and Kanon so that Goda could start preparing breakfast as soon as he woke up. Silence had fallen in the mansion, giving the impression that the mansion itself was still asleep. Well then, let us begin the morning chores. Hi. Yes, sir. The two of them split up and began opening the curtains throughout the mansion. If the curtains stayed closed, the mansion would remain enveloped in faint darkness as though it was still trapped in the previous night. Following a well-rehearsed procedure, Kanon went around the mansion, opening the curtains for one window after another without having to retrace his steps once. Even with this horrible weather, drawing the curtains made it feel just a little bit like morning. While doing that, he passed in front of the kitchen. Even though he hadn't smelled anything yet, his stomach started aching for some of Goda's prized cooking. Good morning. He tried to greet Goda, who should have been getting breakfast ready, but Goda was nowhere to be seen. Is he actually dead? Let's go. The kitchen was darkly lit, and not only were the curtains not open, but the fan wasn't even running. It was still cold without any trace of a fire being lit, so of course there were no signs of breakfast being made either. Though it, w though, it w though it would have been inexcusable, perhaps Goda had overslept. Even servants are only human. They sometimes sleep in and show up late. In the rare case that such a thing happens, it's part of a servant's code to hide the unsightly scene before anyone notices, smoothly cover it up, and make sure the family never even realizes that anything had gone wrong. Kanon took the receiver of the phone that had been fitted into the wall and dialed the number for the extension line of the servant's sleeping room. He couldn't hear that characteristic sound of a dial tone. Kanon tried picking up the receiver again, but even so, he couldn't hear the usual dial tone. He tried dialing again, but it had no apparent effect. Could the lightning last night have damaged some machine, breaking the extension line? The equipment in this mansion was all worn out. Kanon fully understood that even the smallest thing could have caused it to break down. He gave up trying to wake Goda up with the phone and dashed over to the servant's sleeping room. What a sweetheart. Please tell me he's dead. I actually want to find this nigga dead. How long has it been since I last since I stopped sleeping and started lazily staring up at the ceiling? That vague sense of awakening was part of Natsui's usual morning experience. She always slept lightly, and she couldn't sleep at all without medicine. To Natsui's sleep was definitely not a happy thing. When she looked outside, she, she saw that it was still pouring. If she hadn't sensed a tiny amount of light, she might have mistakenly thought that it was still the previous night. She herself was one of the hosts, so she mustn't wake up later than her guests. Urging herself on, she raised up her body, which still had have recovered from yesterday's weariness. No one would torment her as long as she stayed inside this room. That's a pretty room and her headache wouldn't get any worse here. This room was the only place she could find peace. So when she left, it meant returning to the world where her husband's siblings kept trying to stab each other in the back. In that case, wouldn't it be better to just stay locked up in this room forever? 
That ridiculous notion brought a bitter smile to Nasui's face. She was starting to sound like Kenzo. Oh my goodness, man. Natsuhi, you need to come over here to a real nigga. Show you how a real nigga treat a lady like you. Come on, I'm like, for, like real shit, bro. Though she often complained about Kenzo staying locked up in his own room and refusing to attend to everyone else, the truth was that she longed to do the same. Natsuhi gave her head a small shake and her fantasy was replaced by the reawakening of her usual headache. Kenzo would probably fuck with you if you walked to his room and was like, man, I'm sick of these niggas too, bro. Let me hang up there with you. I can't stand these niggas neither, man. <laughs> when she reached for the door knob trying to leave the room, her hand touched the scorpion charm that she had hung from it before going to sleep the previous night. It was Maria's charm, which Natsuhi had received from Jessica. Didn't Jessica say something about it having the power to repel magic? Telling her to hang it from her doorknob? Maybe it was thanks to the charm that this maybe it was thanks to the charm that at least this room had been protected from the malice of her husband's siblings. As she thought this, her mood began to get a little more cheerful. I wonder if I have Jessica to thank for the little bit of peaceful sleep I managed to receive. Then Natsuhi remembered. That's right, last night I promised Jessica that I'd give her a charm of my own in exchange for this one, didn't I? Natsui opened a drawer on her dresser and took out an antique accessory case that she had treasured when she was a child. Inside, there were many small objects that Natsui had thought were valuable at the time. From amidst those, she pulled out a red pouch. Inside was a small round mirror about 10 centimeters across. It looked quite old, but the design on the back of the mirror was quite ornate. It felt like something with historical value. At the very least, it seemed much more authentic than the other charm, which looked like a plastic scorpion keychain. She had heard that this was a spiritual mirror for warding off evil spirits, and she had been given it specifically by her grandmother when her grandfather, grandfather's mementos had been distributed. It had been believed since long ago that a strange power resided in this mirror. Perhaps people thought it could reflect calamity and malice in the same way it reflected light. Natsuhi returned the mirror to its pouch. It would probably be a fitting object to hand over to Jessica. She said she was placing it in her pocket. The sound of someone knocking on the door suddenly echoed throughout the room. Hi. Yes? Good morning, madam. It is Genji. My apologies for waking you so early. I'm coming now. What is it? No servant had ever come to her this early in the morning, nor had they come to wake her in person. Perhaps something bad had happened. Maybe some fatal oversight had been made while preparing breakfast, something that would shame the household in front of their guests. Natsuhi took a deep breath in anticipation for whatever trouble she was about to hear of. When she opened the door, Genji once again gave a morning greeting while bowing deeply. Natsuhi tentatively responded. Good morning. Did something happen? My apologies. It was seen that the telephones are broken down due to the lightning last night. The extension telephone isn't working, so for, please forgive my coming to see you directly. The extension telephone isn't working? That would be troublesome. Will it be possible to fix it? I am afraid we don't know the location of the damage. Later on, I would like to call in an expert and have him repair it. Does that mean we'll be able, unable to have it repaired until after the typhoon passes? Then it will remain broken for the... Then it will remain broken down for the duration of our guest stay. Will that hamper our efforts to care for our guests? We will do all we can to ensure there are no problems. Very well. I'm counting on you to make sure we have no blunders. Natsu we let out a small sigh of relief. She had been prepared for the worst, but damage to the telephone wasn't the kind of trouble she was worried about. Then again, even this would probably be enough to spark sarcasm from Ava. Natsu we gave her head a light shake. Are the preparations for breakfast proceeding well? As to that, we haven't been able to find Gota. The arrangements for breakfast have yet to be carried out. What did you say? Natsuhi was indignant. 
To her, this was a much bigger problem than phones not working. And despite that, this piece of information, which was, which the part had been postponed. But despite that, this piece of information was the part that had been postponed. Why did everything go well most of the time? Then come to something like this when the relatives were visiting. Natsui put her hand on her forehead and shook her head. Well, I suppose we slept in. At any rate, just see to it that someone hurries and prepares breakfast. I don't care who. What? Not till he exited the hall and turned around to for a second to close the door to her room. The creepy thing she saw there silenced her completely. It was unpleasant sight. It was an unpleasant sight. As though someone had dipped their fingers in reddish black liquid and scratched at the door around the doorknob. It was probably some sort of awful prank, arranged by some person who wanted to make it look as though they tried to force the door with bloody hands. What? What sort of prank is this? How awful! I also just noticed it as I came to call you. I will clean it later. Perhaps... This is a vulgar joke by one of the guests. Disgusting, truly disgusting. Who in the world would pull such a childish and disgusting prank? Not so we had a pretty good idea, but of course there was no proof. So even if she pushed the issue, it would just seem as though she was making a fuss about nothing. In fact, it would surely be better to act as though she hadn't realized that such a prank had been played on her. Not so we gave the order to have it cleaned and headed off to the parlor with the, with the squeak of her heels. When Natsuhi and Genji arrived in the parlor, Ava and Hideyoshi was already there. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Natsuhi. I heard Goto will be making us breakfast, too. My stomach's been getting all excited since I woke up. After all, it seems food is all you can look forward to at the head family household. I'm pleased to see that you two are in high spirits early in the morning, Ava. With the weary expression, Natsuhi returned Ava's gaze, which was fiercely competitive despite the early hour. Then Kanon jogged in. After bowing an apology to the relatives for running inside the mansion, he noticed Genji and told him something in a small voice. Kanon, have you still not found Gota? My apologies, madam. I went all over the inside of the mansion in the guest house, but I still haven't found him. Where in the world has he gone? At any rate, breakfast is now breakfast is a higher priority than finding Gota right now. See to it immediately. Yes. Kanon glanced at Genji. It seemed he had something else to report, but was uncertain whether or not the word should come from him. Genji nodded and decided to give the report himself. Madam, it is not only Gota. Your husband is also nowhere to be found. My husband? Yes. Even before visiting you, I went to his room to tell him that the breakfast wasn't being prepared, but I did not find him there. Furthermore, he is not the only one missing. Rudolph, his wife, and Rosa are nowhere to be found. Not in the guest house? Nor the mansion? Yes. They were not in their rooms in the guest house either. When she heard that Gota alone was missing, she'd assume he slept in or was loafing around somewhere. However, now that she learned that several of the relatives were also nowhere to be seen, she began to take a slightly more optimistic view. The last night's family conference has continued all night up until the present mo moment. If so, they might have wanted to cool their heads after being shut in a stuffy room, going out for walks or through their own or on, on their own through the rain. The part about cooling their heads really sounded like something Krauss would say. Goda had probably been summoned to accompany them and aid them in some way. Goda was not a man who lost track of time. He had to understand that preparations for breakfast would be hindered if he did not return. However, 
Maybe the family conference had continued until this very moment, with an atmosphere that would make it hard for anyone to slip out. Yes, that theory would be quite convincing for Natsuhi. She remembered the illusion she felt that morning, as though the previous night had never ended. When she learned that the feeling wasn't just an illusion, she once again took a deep, weary breath. After all, the banquet of filthy vultures circling Kenzo's property was still going on. Perhaps they are still discussing the inheritance somewhere in the garden or maybe the beach. At any rate, if we don't call Gota back, we'll never be able, be, be able to begin preparations for breakfast. So what are you saying? Are uh, Nissan and the rest still continuing the discussion? She had planned to say it in a small voice, but Hideyoshi overheard Natsui and managed to grasp the situation. Nissan and Rudolph sure are tough. Maybe it's just youth in Rosa's case. Just a bit after midnight, the two of us were so tired that we headed back to bed. Though I do remember that Nissan and the rest were still having a heated discussion at that point. Men certainly are unpleasant when they get all fired up. Not so we snorted, her face still blank. Kano, search outside. If you find Gota, tell him to return immediately and begin preparing breakfast. Certainly. Natsui, we don't know for sure that they're outside, do we? Couldn't they also be in father's study? I see, that's certainly possible. I don't know what path their conversation took, but there's certainly a chance they moved the father's study and let him in on the, on the discussion. I can't imagine that father would willingly let them bring such a detestable topic into his study. You really think so? Well then, there's nothing we can do. I'm sorry, Genji and Kanon, but could you search outside? It wouldn't be that strange for Nissan to suggest they go outside for a walk to cool their heads. Even in this weather, I'll go to father's study. Who knows, they might actually be there after all. Ava, I couldn't ask a guest like you to exert herself, so I will go. I can also wish him a good morning while I'm at it. Oh, then I'll leave it in your hands. Though, I somehow doubt he'll return your greeting. Natsuhi, have you always been on such good terms with father? I don't know whether you could call it that, but I am sure that I have gained this trust as the wife of the successor of the Ushiramiya family. Then I'm sure he'll at least answer you, right? I'd like to at least have breakfast with father. Do you think you could convince him to come down and join us? It seems that he thoroughly despises the rest of us, but I'm sure he'll listen to you if he trusts you that much. After speaking so boldly, if you're unable to convince father to come down alone, then I doubt you'll ever be able to claim that you've earned his trust again. <laughs> I am not confident, but I'll try. Natsuhi responded, looking discouraged. However, knowing Kenzo's temperament, she had absolutely no confidence in her ability to bring him out. Ava was clearly mocking him, confident that Natsuhi wouldn't be able to get Kenzo to come down. But even so, Natsuhi would lose faith if she gave up, saying it was impossible and letting Ava go instead. Ava's mean-spirited and unreasonable demand made Natsuhi clench her fist slightly. When Genji realized this, she, he softly spoke over their shoulder. Madam, please take this if you would. And this is? Genji handed Natsui a sparkling gold key of ornate design. It was the key to Kenzo's study. The study had an auto lock that couldn't be unlocked as long as Kenzo forbade the entrance. However, since, Genzo, since Genji was especially trusted by Kenzo, he was allowed to carry a key to that door. But if this key is used, won't you also receive the blame? When the master is sleeping deeply, simply knocking on the door will not suffice. And it would be more difficult to persuade the master to leave his room if you must talk through the door. Please, use this. Genji. Genji a real nigga, bro. I fucking love Genji. Until now, Natsui had thought of Genji as a cold servant who wouldn't do anything for her, since he worked directly under Kenzo. But it looked like she would have to alter her understanding of him. She wanted to communicate her gratitude, but by then, Genji had already turned his back on her, 
and was walking down the corridor with Kanon. But as Natsuhi watched them go, the words directed at her from behind were sneering. Well then, you must bring father with you, okay? After all, it's his son's precious, it's his son's precious wife who's asking. I'm sure he'll listen to you. We're guests, so we'll just relax here at our leisure. Quit it, Ava! You're taking this too far. Sorry, Natsui, but we're counting on you to deal with father. Without answering, Natsui forcefully spun around on her heels and quickly left that place. Every time Ava talks, I like her less and less. I'm not gonna lie, man. It's a shame. Because I really fucked with her at first. After all that excitement the previous night, there was no way anyone was going to wake up early. George, Jessica, and I were snoring loudly on the beds in the cousin's room. But Maria, who had gone straight to bed without joining in, was completely awake. As she rubbed her sleepy eyes and looked around, she was met with the loud snoring of the three other cousins. For a while, Maria had to think about what had happened. After that, she realized her mother wasn't with her and she got quickly got lonely. Maria left the cousin's room, trying to head to the room that had been arranged for her and her mother. Paying no heed to the three who were sleeping soundly, she slammed the door shut. In response, Battler mumbled and rolled over in his sleep, but it wasn't enough to wake him up. After a while, Maria returned, once again opening the door with a lively bang. When she had left the room, her face had been sleepy, but now that she was back, she looked irritated. After that, she climbed up on Battler's bed, which happened to be the closest, and started yelling and jumping on her like it was a trampoline. I would've smacked the fuck out of her. <laughs> what, what, what? What's going on? Is, is it an enemy raid? Surround them! After making sure I was awake, Mario moved over to George's bed and started jumping on that too. In that manner, all three of us were greeted with an extremely pleasant awakening. Thanks for waking us up, Mario. You stopped us from sleeping in after that late night. If only you could have been a bit more gentle about it. George, you really are an adult. I respect that. It'll be seven soon. Well, it's not really a bad time to wake up. Mama's not here! Aunt Rosa? She wasn't in her room? I wonder if she's already woken up and gone to the mansion. Not here! Mama! Maria kept groaning, uh, uh, and looking unhappy. She didn't exactly seem lonely because her mother wasn't around. It was more like she was irritated and thrown off balance because her mother wasn't where she'd expected. If we could tell, if we could just tell where her, her where their mother was, that alone would be probably calm her down. But unfortunately, we had no way of knowing where Aunt Rosa was, except that she wasn't here. Anyway, it's time for breakfast, so let's head over to the mansion. That's right. Maria, let's go to the mansion together, okay? I'm sure Aunt Rosa will be there too. Mama's in the mansion? Then I'll go there. Yeah, guess we should, guess we should go to the mansion. Our parents are probably already gone there. Maria regained her usual composure so completely, her earlier tantrum now seemed like a lie. We got dressed, left the room, and headed for the mansion. Once more, there was a knocking sound on the study door, but there was no answer. He seemed to be sleeping still, and I could not wake him. If she went back downstairs and said something like that, Ava would probably be amused and triumphant. And even putting Ava aside, it was problematic that Kenzo had stayed shut away in his, shut away during this 
entire once a year conference, not even coming down to greet anyone. Even the family head, no, especially the family head, couldn't fail to make an appearance. I wonder if I can convince him myself. Natsumi readied herself and used the key that she borrowed from Genji to open the door. I'm kind of scared about what's going to happen. Even though she was prepared for the sweet stench, which seemed to eat into one's brain as it poured out the small crack in the door, she couldn't help but grimace. Thinking that he might still be sleeping, not so we entered the room quietly. When she did, Kenzo was already awake and looking down out the window. So you're awake. Good morning. How did you get in? Kenzo spoke with his back still facing her. His voice was not harsh but calm, and Natsu was slightly reassured. I wouldn't trust that though. I wouldn't trust that. I feel like, I feel like Kenzo was a type of person who would be like, "How are you? How did you get in? Uh, somebody gave me a key. I'ma beat the fuck out of you." <laughs> I feel like you didn't have a person to fucking to switch shit so quick. Like, somebody gave you a key. I'm gonna beat the shit out of you. <laughs> However, though, he was awake. He wouldn't have ignored all that knocking if he was in a good mood. Not so he wasn't able to relax. My sincere apologies. I, was at, I asked Genji and he allowed me to borrow the key to the study. Oh. Genji did. If my friend thought it was that important, then I have no choice but to listen. So, what business do you have with me? Well, breakfast will be ready soon, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would join us. I will eat here. Have it brought here like always. But father, this family conference happens only once a year. Please, at least let them see your face. Go back downstairs. Are you asking me to join in as they discuss how to chew up my inheritance after I die? How foolish. Let them speak of such matters as they please without me. And if that's what you call a family conference, it's hardly worth leaving my room for it. I am busy. Do not bother me. His last words carried the threat that any further questions would not be appreciated. Not till he realized that adding any further pleas would finally bring his wrath down upon her. She didn't look forward to facing Ava's sarcasm, but there was nothing more Natsui could do. Is that so? Understood. I am sure everyone will be sorry to hear it, but I will tell them. Natsui decided to give up. Bowing silently, she tried to leave the room before Kenzo's spasmodic temper could flare up. As she did, Kenzo spoke to her. His voice was so calm and gentle, it felt like it came from an entirely different person. Natsuhi. Natsuhi. It has been quite some time since you married into the Oshiramiya family. Yes. It has been many years since I was first permitted to bear the name of Shiramiya. Do you sometimes long for your previous family? No. Marriage means abandoning your birth family. I am Oshiramiya Natsuhi. The Oshiramiya family is the only family I, come, I can come home to, the only one I am fond of. She truly wasn't exaggerating. Such was the resolve she felt whenever she applied the Oshiramiya family name to herself. And that's precisely why she was so sad when her husband didn't treat her like an Oshiramiya, leaving her to race about in vain. If Kraus were a woman, and you were his husband, no, I won't say that. What do you mean by that? Father. Natsuhi was shocked. If Kenzo's words just not were what they seemed, it would have been more than enough to make up for all she'd suffered at that point. Forget it. It's just the nonsense of an old man. 
I fucking love you, Kenzo. Finally! Of course it's my GOAT! Of course my GOAT is the one that recognizes Natsuhi's loyalty and love for this family, bro. Everybody else treat her like shit. But of course my GOAT is the only one who recognizes that she's the only one in this family that actually fucks with him. Kenzo once again faced away from her. He told her to forget it, but Natsui couldn't help feeling a warmth in her heart. Father, even though I, Natsuhi, am not connected to you by blood, I am still your daughter. I will most assuredly see to it that your honor and glory and everything you have left behind are protected. You do not have the right to wear the one-winged eagle. However, the one-winged eagle is surely engraved in your heart. That is irrefutable proof that you are my blood relative, one who will inherit the glory of the Oshiramiya family. Some will sneer that there is no eagle on your clothes, but such words are not worth laying a near to. Only those who hold the eagle in their hearts are my true blood relatives. I now consider it an honor that you were welcomed into the Oshiramiya family. Without saying anything more, Kenzo remained with his back to Natsuhi. However, Natsuhi couldn't help but feel something warm well up inside her that she, that she hadn't felt since long ago when she had just been a child. Natsuhi bowed slightly to his back and left the room. Ah, good timing. How's father? You were taking so long, so I came to check. When Natsui left the study, she saw Ava climbing the stairs, and their eyes met. Ava was smirking unpleasantly, thinking that Natsui would leave, the grudging, would leave drudgingly after failing to convince Kenzo. However, the way Natsui was now, such a frivolous laugh would not disturb her. She was not permitted to wear the family crest on her clothing, but she was permitted to wear it in her heart. So she spoke calmly, clearly, and confidently with the dignity of one that who would protect the Ushirimiya family's glory. Father said he would not join in on a family conference. He says he has no interest in discussing such obscene matters. I figured you'd say something like that. If you fail to persuade Father, just say so. How pitiful. I'm beginning to see why Father lamented so. What? What do you mean by that? Natsui did not answer. Just as Kenzo had done earlier, she showed Ava her back as she headed down the stairs. Ava finally realized that she was being made fun of, that something had happened to quickly bolster Natsui's confidence. Even so, she apparently didn't have the courage to risk Kenzo's wrath. Unable to knock on the door, she could only click her tongue, make a motion as though scratching at it, and follow up the Natsui. So, were Nissan and the rest there? Did you ask father about them? I didn't get the chance to ask, but they were not inside the study. Father would never let them into his room to discuss such a lowly topic, so it is unlikely he knows where they went. Let us go downstairs and wait for the servants to return from their search. Breakfast may be late, but how would you like some tea, Ava? That would be fine. Ava couldn't hide her confusion at the complete difference in Natsui's attitude. She was acting so boldly, and while Ava hated to admit it, she even had a sense of dignity about her. Unable to find fault with anything, Ava could only follow Natsui back to the parlor. Love to see it, man. Love to see it. When the two of them returned to the parlor, Hideyoshi had been joined by the four children and Nanja. Genji, who had been talking with Hideyoshi, reported the current situation when he noticed that Natsui had returned. You still have not found my husband in the rest? Yes, my apologies. Also, Kumasawa has started preparing breakfast. She said that she, need, she would need just a little longer. The clock read a little past eight. Eight should have been a time to start breakfast. Normally going over that time limit would be a disgrace to the host. Kanon is now searching outside. Also, no one has seen Shanon either. Even Shanon's missing? 
truly, just how many people did my husband bring with him on his little walk? Just how many people had gone missing by now? Now that the number was this large, it was starting to feel truly unpleasant. As though the people here were the only ones being left out of something interesting. At least, that seemed to reflect the feelings of the children, and Maria in particular. She was indignant, her stomach grumbling, almost as though her mother and the others had left her alone to go off and eat something delicious without it. The other children were flipping through the channels on the television, trying to find a program that might interest Maria and cheer her up again. Nanjo was sitting on the sofa, gazing blissfully at the children while reading a book. It must have been a book about chess. The sound of footsteps came rushing towards them with a pitter patter. There was only one set, so they realized before seeing who it, seeing who it was, seeing who it belonged to, it was probably Kanan, not Kraus and the rest. Madam, excuse me. Judging by your appearance, you still haven't been able to find them. My apologies. I still haven't. That'll be enough. You've worked hard. She didn't know where they were, but they had to be somewhere on this island. They hadn't they hadn't had a thing to eat since the previous night, so their stomachs must be growling about now. They'd probably come plodding back on their own accord before long. By now, Natsu was thoroughly exasperated and started to feel that there was no reason for them to go out of their way and search. I will go to the kitchen and prepare some tea for all the guests. Thanks to both of you for your hard work so early in the morning. Natsui left the parlor, acting as though the release and tension had caused a new surge in her headache. Kanan tried to call her back, but Natsui left swiftly. What is it? Was there something else? Yes. I was unable to find her husband or anyone else, but... Well... Kanan sounded evasive. It looked as though he didn't know where they were, but had spotted something that might be connected to their disappearance. Ava and Hideyoshi noticed this exchange of words and came over. They probably picked up on something strange in Kanon's behavior. What's going on, Kanon? Did you find Kraus and other, did you find Kraus and everyone else? Actually, the Rose Garden storehouse looked strange. What do you mean? It looked strange. It was um how should I explain it? Kanan hesitated once more. His tone wasn't at all what you'd expect from his usually fearless boy. Seeing this, Ava and Hideyoshi looked at each other dubiously. What do you mean? Are you saying Nissan and the others were inside the storehouse? No. I'm going to inspect the inside now. I just now came back to get the key, but... Um... I don't really get it, but it sounds like you just got to look around the inside of it. Where's the key to the storehouse? It is in a servant room. Let us check inside the storehouse at once. Kanan dashed off to the servant room and returned with the key. Genji left the parlor saying he would go check, but then Ava and Hideyoshi followed after him. What was this something strange about the storehouse that had caused the usually fearless Kanon to hesitate? It was still pouring outside, but perhaps their curiosity over this something that Kanon couldn't talk about won out. While the children made a big fuss watching television, Kanon and the rest dashed over to the entrance. The Rose Garden Storehouse that was placed the Rose Garden storehouse was a place that housed various tools used to manage the garden. It was definitely not a pretty building. Because of its appearance, it had been built so that it was hidden in the corner of the Rose Garden. Kanan, Genji, Ava, came cutting across the Rose Garden holding umbrellas. They entered a small path just off of the Rose Garden, which was normally off limits for those appreciating the garden and only used by those maintaining it. As they dashed down that, the storehouse came into view in front of them. It was quite an old shed, and compared to the flawlessly perfect beauty of the rose garden, it was pretty seedy looking. 
That fucking lightning, damn. Again? It was easy to understand why I had been built in a park to see place. Ava and Hideyoshi arrived at the storehouse long after Kana and Genji. <sighs> You two sure are fast. Thought my heart was gonna explode. I never knew they had a storehouse way over here. But what? What is that? When Ava looked where Kanon was pointing, she was at a loss for words. Noticing this, Hideyoshi also followed Kanon's finger and was likewise too shocked to speak. The entrance to the storehouse was some kind of shutter, and there. Everyone suddenly realized why Kanon had been able, unable to find the words to describe what they now saw. On the shutter, which was completely filthy from being exposed to wind and rain for so long, stuck right on it. There was something that looked like a dark red liquid. Mucus? Or maybe it was some sticky paint? An indescribably eerie shape was drawn on the shutter with some kind of ghastly substance. The rain had caused it to drip down like fresh blood leaking from an open wound. No more beating around the bush. Some kind of mark was drawn there, with the ghastly substance that looked like blood, and the shape that seemed to success subject something ominous. Two circles were drawn there, and inside them was a design that looked like a cross. The four ends of the cross were widely exaggerated, and it looked like some kind of crest from somewhere around Europe. And in the cracks between these shapes, written closely packed together were some unfamiliar characters or possibly symbols. What a vulgar bit of graffiti! Could this be one of those? One of those magic circles used in demonic ceremonies? It wasn't surprising that Hideyoshi would say that about such a ghastly shape drawn with a deep red dripping substance. When was this made? Last night, I came here before it started raining and there was nothing drawn here at the time. We must do something before anyone else sees this. If they laid eyes upon it, it would cause them great discomfort. That's right. Even though it's just a shed, I wouldn't want to leave such an unpleasant piece of graffiti alone for even a second longer than I had to. There is some paint inside the storehouse. Let us paint over it temporarily as an emergency measure. Then repaint it again someday when the weather is good. Genji remembered that he had just seen another scribble, and that it too had been made with a strange dark red substance of the same color as this. That must have been. That's right, when he had seen it on the door to Natsui's room. Kanoka. Kano, let's remove this squibble quickly and go back, okay? Even though it's just a storehouse, it's really irritated and have graffiti around the home I was brought up in. Yes, ma'am. I will take care of it immediately. Kano squatted in front of the shutter and unlocked it. He then lifted it up with all his strength. A boisterous noise resounded and the eerie shape drawn out on the shutter began to get sucked through the top of the, sh of the shutter was raised. At least for the time being, the ominous drawing disappeared from their direct gaze and they all breathed a sigh of relief. Until they found everyone's corpses in the- Thanks to a kids program they came across, Mario was feeling much better. Battler and Jessica were poking fun at the kids' show at every turn, cackling together. George was enjoying the program with Mario from her perspective. Nanjo sat on the sofa by himself, passing the time by reading quietly. They heard hurried footsteps coming from the hallway. They were the footsteps of a single person. Did that mean it wasn't the group before that had just left? It was Genji. It was very rare for Genji, who considered being out of breath a violation of servant's virtues, to be gasping for air. He had probably come dashing back from outside the mansion. His shoulders were so so soaking wet, and he didn't have his usual trim appearance. When Genji noticed Nanjo looking at him, he gave a small, silent bow and quickly approached him. Nanjo, sensei. Dr. Nanjo, my apologies. Please, come with me quickly. What? What is the matter? 
As Genji whispered something into Na Nanjo's ear, Nanjo went pale. He rose from the sofa, trying not to be noticed by the children who were still engrossed by the TV. And the two of them rapidly left the parlor, muffling their footsteps. Just as they were about to exit the parlor, they came across Natsuhi, who was pushing a serving cart loaded with a tea set. Genji whispered something in Natsui's ear, and Natsui went pale too in apparent shock. Then leaving the serving cart where it was, the three of them dashed towards the entrance. George noticed them running down the rose garden through the window. What's that? Isn't that Genji and Dr. Nanjo and... That's Aunt Natsuhi, isn't it? What's up, Aniki? Maybe something happened. They look terribly flustered. When Jessica and Mar Maria saw that Ava, Hideyoshi, and Nanjo were no longer in their seats and that the serving cart had been abandoned in the entrance of the parlor, they also realized that something was the matter. Could there have been some kind of accident? Let's go check it out. It's no fun if we're the only ones left out, right? <laughs> For some reason, what Battler said sounded extremely indiscreet. But they couldn't deny that they were a little insecure and concerned after seeing the adults run off into the rain without regard to their appearance. Let's check it out, okay? I'm worried something might have happened. Jessica's uneasy words spoke for all of them. Hey, Maria, you coming too? Or will you watch TV? Want to watch TV? Shit. Let's go on without it. Maria, we'll be back soon. You keep watching TV, okay? By the time the kids made it outside, the adults were no longer in sight. But Jessica seemed to have a pretty idea of where they'd gone, judging by the direction they'd been running. Following Jessica, we ran through the rain-soaked rose garden. The wind seemed to suddenly get stronger. The malicious sound of thunder began to ring out like it had the previous night. It felt like an eerie something had surrounded the island and was trying to stop us from moving forward. Jessica, Jessica is there something over this way? I'm pretty sure there's a storehouse for gardening tools or something. What in the world could be going on in a place like that? Just as Jessica had said, they began to see a storehouse in front of them. They could also see the adults there. The shutter to the storehouse was open. Several adults looked as though they were searching for something. For some reason, only Natsuhi was outside the storehouse. Without even holding an umbrella, she looked like she was hanging her head, and her back was facing them. There was Genji, Nanjo, and Natsuhi who had just left the mansion. The ones who left earlier, Kanon, Eiba, and Hideyoshi were also there, making for a small crowd of people. But there was absolutely no bustle of activity. When Natsui realized that the children were approaching, a terrible expression ran rose to her face, and she ran at them with her arms spread wide. You mustn't come any closer! Go back to the mansion! But despite that, no, because of that, the kids saw the scene Natsui was trying to keep them away from. Inside the storehouse with its shutter wide open, a faint fluorescent light shone down. And right there was... <coughs> Jessica's piercing shriek rang out. But that was just because Jessica's scream was the loudest. The same thing spilled out of battle or in George's mouths as well. Ava spread her arms just like Natsuhi. Roaring at the kid with a bone-chilling expression on her face. George, take everyone and return to the mansion! Quickly! Right now! When Natsui spread her arms, I thought she was trying to prevent it from advancing any further. But that wasn't why Ava was spreading her arms right now. She was trying to stop us kids from seeing that terrible scene. It was her mother's heart, trying to protect the eyes and hearts of his children by blocking our view from, from that terrible scene by at least the width of one of her arms. Is, is this some kind of joke? Is it? I'd seen this kind of cheap scene all too often, 
in manga, TV, anime, and movies. I've seen it over and over again. This was just, just seeing something appear in real life that I've seen plenty of times before in some of those sensational movies, right? That alone shouldn't, uh, but that, that suit, it's that old bastards, isn't it? I get it. Then that's Uncle Krause and Kyrie and Aunt Rosa. Ah! Fuck. Dad, Dad! You mustn't, Jessica. You mustn't go in. You mustn't look. Dad, Dad! Rigor mortis has set in across almost the entire body. Most likely, six hours or more have passed since death. As far as I can tell by looking at the damaged area, there is a high probability that they were damaged after their deaths. No, I must watch what I say. I'm a general practitioner, examining corpses outside my area of expertise. So what does that mean? Just killing them wasn't enough? So they went on to do something like this? The devil! This here's the work of the devil! Aunt Nasuni caught Jessica in her arms, and Aunt Ava caught George. So I was the only one who could approach the entrance of the storehouse. Ah. Uh, if only there had been someone to catch me too. I wouldn't have needed to have this horrible, evil scene burn into my eyes. No, that's not it. It isn't that there's no one here to catch me. The people who should catch me, they're right there, aren't they? Just as Jessica said, it did look like the storehouse was for gardening tools. The lawn mowers with extra blades, the grass sickle and the hammer, some carpentry tools such as a saw, piled up potted plants and bags of fertilizer and treated just the same the corpses that several people have been laid to rest there no had just been tossed there i could tell them by their clothes that old bastard and kyrie uncle kraus and Aunt rosa beyond that goda and are there still more of them how many people died you're fucking kidding me I can't even count them on one hand, damn it! I didn't know whether it had, had been one of those gardening tools, which if, it, which if used for something other than their intended purpose could definitely be wielded with nuke and break brutality. Or whether some horrible tool had been brought in here specifically for this. Anyway, each of the bodies jammed in here had been given an atrocious makeup. It wasn't makeup, it was more like their faces have been plowed. Their faces were smashed, forced into expressions that normal people couldn't even make after death. I couldn't tell where the eyes or the noses were, but I could find their mouths because they were gaping wide, their gums exposed, but their front teeth were missing. And even the cheeks that should have covered all this were torn up and laid bare. That trendy makeup you always spend so much time on even though you're a man isn't doing anything now. I always thought you were going to hell. But still, not like this, right? You are such a son of a bitch that you shouldn't have to suffer so brutally. It's curious. Didn't I tell you to stop going out with this guy? There's absolutely no reason for you to end up like this too. They've got no faces, no faces. Damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. Battler, you mustn't look anymore. There's no way your mother and father will want you to see them like this. For your mother and father's sake, you mustn't look anymore. Dead people are supposed to have faces that look like they're sleeping peacefully, right? They've got no faces! My daddy killing him, no faces! I don't even know what kind of face they were making when they died! What's wrong with me? Will I have to see these smashed monster like faces every time I remember them? That's just great! 
I didn't want to remember that old bastard slug face anyway. Just great, just great. But why even Kyrian? Kyrian wasn't a crook. Sure, she ticked me off a bit now and then. But she wasn't a, like a, she was like a big cool big sister to me. This is wrong. This is all wrong. At least Uncle Cross has it better, doesn't he? It's not his whole face, it's a side. At least, at least he's got half his face left, right? That's still better, that's still better. Jessica filled her ears with the sound of her own screaming, trying to shut out my reckless words. Stop it, battler. Just, just stop it, just stop it. Disregarding age and appearance, I fell to my knees clinging to Anaki's waist and sobbing. It was as if I was crying on behalf of everyone there. Representing the feelings of everyone there, I screamed over and over. Fuck. Father, the ones lying dead, lying over there are Uncle Kraus, Uncle Rudolph, Aunt Kyrie, and Aunt Rosa and Gota. Just those five, right? No. There are six people. There's one more person over here. Damn, it's Shannon, isn't it? The body Hideyoshi was looking down on now happened to be hidden among the shadows in the mountain range of objects in a blind spot to George who stood by the entrance. So George couldn't tell whose body it was. So George cursed himself. He cursed the fact that his worst guesses always turned out to be right. So, the one lying at your feet is... Shannon, isn't it? Oh. Yes, it's Shannon. George fell completely silent. He shook slightly, his lower lip trembling. Normally, he would have wanted to run to his beloved's body, screaming and crying. However, before rashly rushing forward, he worked to keep his composure and asked his father, Fuck. What the fuck, bro? Yo, Ryukishi, fuck you, bruh. For real. Is Shannon the same as Uncle Kraus and the others? Hideyoshi deeply understood the meaning of those words, so he couldn't give George an immediate answer. Or rather, he felt that silence was the only sincere and loving response he could give George right now. When George asked if Shannon was the same, he meant to ask whether her corpse was in the same condition as the others or not. Since Hideyoshi hadn't denied it, it meant her corpse was in the same brutal state. Can I look at Shannon? No. You can't. Why not? After all, I won't be able to see Shannon's face again, right? So why won't you let me see? What's your face look like at the end? Fuck, damn, nigga. The last time you met Shannon was yesterday, right? Yes. I see. When you left her, what kind of face was she showing you? It was a wonderful smile. After he handed her the ring, she hesitated even though she must have already made up her mind. Then she looked bashful and ran away because she was embarrassed to let him see her face looking like that. That's the expression that, always re that was always revived in George's mind. I see. Then I'm sure 
Shana will want to leave you with that smile in your memory. Hideyoshi looked down upon Shana's body laying at his feet. Just like the other bodies, it was in such a horrible state. They didn't make anyone want to cover their eyes. Her head had been smashed in from the side, and no more than half of her expression remained. If the remaining blood-soaked half of her expression had been wiped clean, would that graceful smile of, her, smile of hers have peeked out? But only half of it. Without thinking, Hideyoshi slapped his eyes with hands over his eyes. How brutal. Her face was going to be crushed anyway. Then if only all of it had been crushed, he might have been able to temporarily distract George from his pain by making the pathetic suggestion that it was someone else wearing Shannon's clothes. But half of her face had been left untouched. It caused the body so much humiliation, while still proving beyond doubt that the body was Shannon's and no one else's. How inhuman, how brutish. And there, trying his best to burn the image of the remaining half of Shannon's expression into his eyes, as she lay at Hideyoshi's feet, was Kanon. Kanon was not crying. Tears had risen to his eyes, but they did not drip down. But that didn't mean he wasn't feeling as much sadness as everyone else. Losing Shannon, who had lived with him in the same orphanage, whom he loved as a sister, must have been must have been just the same as losing a blood relative. Georgie. George, I'm sure Shannon is saying thank you. She must be glad you didn't end up seeing her in such a pitiful state. I'm sure. She's thanking you for holding strong and showing restraint. I understand. I understand, father, I understand. George leaned against the outside wall of the storehouse, crouching down limply. Father, I have a request. What is it? I want you to look for me. Is there a ring on Shannon's finger? A ring? Let me see. Hideyoshi crouched down. As he did, Kana silently pointed to one of Shannon's hands. Yeah. There is. It's a diamond ring with a valuable diamond. It must have been pretty expensive. And which hand? Wh and which finger is it on? The ring finger on her left hand. I see. So Shannon was engaged. George, don't tell me you. That doesn't matter now. A man made a lifelong promise to Shana. A man promised her happiness for life. Who that man was is the issue here. Being told that by a man is a woman's dream, isn't it? I don't know when she received this ring. I also don't know who gave it to her. However, even so, Shana took this ring. Then she accepted it and put it on her left ring finger. I'm sure the man who gave it to her was also happy. To most of the people there, Hideyoshi was simply disturbed by this extraordinary situation and was blurting out nonsense. However, someone who knew of George and Shana's true relationship would understand the full meaning of those words. I see. Thank you, Father. George stood up. The traces of tears still streaked his face, and his expression was something. Let's go. Battle it, Jessica. If we stay here any longer, we'll get in the way of the adults. You're right. Jessica sniffled once, showing her face to her mother, who had been holding her the whole time, to let her know she was okay now. When she faced George again, she once again had on her unusual expression. Although she still couldn't smile. Battler, hang in there. Battler kept on crouching in front of his parents' bodies. I'm sorry. Crying like hell calmed me down. 
You bastard, Dad. I bet you're laughing at me. After all, that shit I talked about you. Here I am crying like a baby just because you died. Well, so what? I guess I just got the gene that makes you cry when your parents kick the bucket. Battler's face was still red from tears. But he at least had recovered enough to fake a smile, if only a bitter one. Kano, you mustn't remain here any longer either. Take the children and return to the mansion. Natsu had been standing under the rain this whole time, unable to take a step into the storehouse. Maybe she had her own way of grieving different from battlers. Realizing that she had to take on the role of responsibility now that her husband was dead, she gave Kanon those orders. Hi. Yes, Oksama. madam. Kanon rose silently and turned to face me. His face was pure white, almost as though his own heart had died along with Shannon, and there was no life in his expression. On an ordinary day, if he had been told to guide the children through this beautiful rose garden, Kanon might have led the way, but now, there was no distinction between Kanon and the children. They were now just kids about the, of about the same age, suffering the pain of losing those close to them. After making sure that the children were leaving, Natsui started giving orders to Genji. Genji. Contact the police immediately. They probably won't be able to come into the Typhoon Passes, but they should be able to tell us what to do next. Understood. There is an emergency radio, so I will use that to contact them. When she heard that, Natsui remembered. That's right, the phones were out today, weren't they? However, they also had a radio, since they couldn't necessarily rely on phones all the time while living on an isolated island. At any rate, they should start by contacting the police and receiving their instructions. Everything else could wait. Dr. Nanjo. Is there anything more you can do here? Unfortunately, there is nothing I can do. Understood. Genji, could you at least cover their faces with something? Exposing them like this is humiliating to them as well. Yes, ma'am. Genji picked up several dry towels from the st inside the storehouse, and when Ava stopped him with a shrill voice, Wait a second! Stop! This is the scene of a crime, isn't it? And we mustn't disturb it. We all panicked and walked in there with our shoes on, but even that'll get in the way of police investigation, right? Not so we glared at Ava, offended. Objectively speaking, Ava was right. Even so, she glared at Ava as though accusing her of refusing to do those tragic corpses, which has been humiliated even after death. The simple kindness of covering their faces. However, Ava had spoken both calmly and correctly. This horrible situation definitely wasn't an accident. It was a crime. Someone had killed them. This was a murder case. So they needed to be careful to avoid disturbing the site any further. They had to do what they could to aid the police. Preserving clues might help catch the detestable culprit. I agree with Ava. Until the police come, we should leave everything be. What do you say, madam? You're right. Very well. Close it up. And just in case, we should put a different lock on it. A different lock? Yes. When we came here, the shutter was locked. That means the culprit used the key to the shutter to lock it. That makes sense. So does that mean the key that opens the shutter will have the culprit's fingerprints on it? We're sure it'll be worth submitting it to the police as evidence. But Kanon usually has it, and he used it to unlock the shed just now. It'll probably have Kanon's fingerprints on it. Also, that key was handed to Genji just now, and he took it with his bare hands. Does it look like it'll be very useful as evidence? That was careless of me. My apologies. Genji, are there any other keys to the storehouse? No. Only this one. So the culprit walked out of the servant room with that key. 
and then was nice enough to return the key where they found it. Hideyoshi's theory sounded plausible, but was actually very strange if you thought about it. Why would they go through all the trouble of returning a key they stole? Now, if you think about it even more deeply, there are some points that are even more bizarre. When a criminal hides a body, they're usually trying to delay the point at which it'll be found, so they use that time to escape. The six weren't necessarily killed here, but it was reasonable to assume they were killed somewhere on this island, carried to this storehouse, and hidden to delay the discovery of the crime. And yet, the eerie magic circle scribbled on the storehouse shutter had eloquently indicated the location of the hidden corpses. Surely it didn't explicitly mention the corpses, but six people had gone missing. In that situation, someone had made it an obvious piece of graffiti and even returned the key to the shutter, almost as though they wanted the corpses to be discovered. Anyway, we can't put all, we can't put all our faith into a lock that the culprit is open once before. If we want to protect this place from the culprit's hand, I think we should put a new lock on it. I think that's a good plan. I agree. Genji fished around inside the storehouse and unsealed a brand new padlock that had been inside a small box. What should I do with the key? I'll take it. I will take responsibility and hand it over to the police. Natsui took the key from the padlock to the padlock from Genji's hand. After that, they all exited and lowered the shutter. And so, the corpses were once again sealed behind that shutter, which was still covered with that creepy magic circle. Genji, Genji crouched down in front of the shutter to fasten a new padlock. Shutters often have a place in front where you can attach your own lock in addition to the main lock on the shutter. This was one of those types. In the midst of the roar of thunder and the pouring rain, the storehouse stood there ominously. With its closed shutter, still covered in blood-like, creepy substance, it swallowed up the bodies of the six. To Natsuki, putting a new lock on wasn't mainly to present the scene for the police. She also felt like she wanted to shut that mouth for all eternity, to prevent that eerie beast from swallowing up any more victims. Come on, let's go everyone. Dr. Nanja, I thank you very much for your work. Genji, hurry up and contact the police. I will do so as I return. The adults left the storehouse. The ghastly magic circle drawn on the shutter kept the six bodies in its throat, looming eerily at the light as the lightning occasionally lit it up. Fuck! Damn! They really just dead like that! Fuck! He has the right to lament his ill fortune. Chosen by the demon's roulette, that's all there is to it. I'll get to see her again so I don't feel lonely. How unfortunate. Apparently he was originally supposed to be on duty at the guest house. Don't worry, everyone will be revived in the Golden Land. This is the beginning of everything. Just make sure, just, just make sure Kraut stays dead. That's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoyed, like, subscribe, leave a comment, or read a mod tap into the next one. Man, if, if, if I got some um, Umi Neko or VN friends, watch, fans watching me right now, y'all new to, y'all new to me, then y'all just saw first, y'all you know y'all new to y'all y'all just new to me and how I react to shit. Y'all just saw firsthand that I'm a bitch, bro. Like dead ass. Just the atmosphere of the situation and how sad the characters were. That was more than enough to make me start tearing up and about to cry. Like real shit. But damn, that's fucked. They just just casually wiped out two of my favorite characters. Like. Kyrie and Rudolph just casually wiped them the fuck out. I mean, I'm glad Krauss is dead. Fuck that, nigga. Rosa, I'm a little upset about that. I did like her, you know? She was a sweetheart. Shannon, like, come on, man. I wanted to see Shannon and George. I wanted to see them, like, you know, I wanted to see them flourish and shit, man. That's fucked.
But damn, this chapter blindsided the fuck out of me, but this was a great ass chapter. Holy fuck. Peace out, I love y'all. Tap into the next one. I did plan on recording like P5 or Tsukihime today, but like, shit, I might, I might have to just record this again just to see how to, to see what happens next. Peace out, I love y'all.